For 16 years, from 1989 through 2004, Book Notes was C-SPAN's signature author interview program. Focusing exclusively on contemporary nonfiction, the Book Notes series created an unparalleled television forum for writers of history, biography, politics, and public and cultural affairs. The Book Notes format was simple. One author, one book, one hour. For a full hour every Sunday night, 52 weeks a year, nonfiction writers were asked to discuss their most recent work. Beyond the book subject matter, authors were also queried about their research, their writing process, and their own lives and influences. The result is a body of televised interviews that serve as a lasting scholarly resource for authors, researchers, students, readers, and educators. George Mason University Libraries is now adding to this trove of information by re-interviewing selected authors about their experiences as part of the Book Notes series. Good morning. Today is Thursday, August 14th, 2014, and we are interviewing author Nathan McCall, who appeared on Book Notes on March 6th, 1999 to discuss his book makes me want to holler a young black man in america i am oral historian misha griffith and bob vay is our audio engineer good morning mr mccall good morning thank you so much for agreeing to do this i would like to know how did your book come to be on book notes well um makes me want to holler was published by random house and uh their people in their publicity department worked very aggressively to uh, try to get me an interview on uh, book notes. You know, they talked about how important it was and, you know, that it would be a great thing if they could make it happen. And they were able to make it happen. Well, it, as it turns out, uh, many of the people, many of the authors on book notes, um, were white, so so we know from interviews that the uh, producers went were tried to be tried to uh, to work very hard to bring in minority um, voices to be part of the conversation. And of okay, course, yes, I didn't um, I didn't know about the internal workings. Mm -hmm. Uh, there, but um, I did get the sense <laughs> when I arrived that um, some of the black people who worked there were glad to see me. <laughs> 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 um, and uh, so I did get the sense, you know, that that you know there weren't a lot of African Americans or you know people from other ethnic groups. The diversity wasn't as great as everybody would have wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I don't know to what extent, you know, that factored into the decision uh, to bring me on or not. I think that um, I know that by um, at that point makes me want to holler had created quite a bit of buzz and it had hit the uh, New York Times bestseller list. And so, I, you know, it was probably a confluence of factors. Mm -hmm. that came together um, to make it happen. Well, how did you prepare for your appearance on Book Notes? Well, it, it's interesting. Um, again, the publicity people at Random House uh, did a great job of preparing me for the book tour and for interviews um, and I remember the first couple of times I did it without that preparation, I sort of bombed oh. because, you know, quite often I would get uh, interviews, I would land good interviews, but it would be people who had not read the book. Mm. And so <laughs> the publicity people are very, you know, it's very important that they underscored the importance of being able to figure out how to counteract that so that you could promote your book. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I, I worked with a, a, a media specialist for a minute to, you know, learn how to steer a conversation 
uh, to a point where I can summarize what the book was about. Right. Quite often I would go to interviews and, you know, um, I could tell that the person interviewing me was winging it. I mean, really winging it. Uh... <laughs> and and so with uh, Brian, I distinctly recall them saying, listen, you know, this is one of the few people who actually reads the book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and... Yeah. I think even at that point, um, I had had enough experiences with people who had not read the book or not read enough of the book to really be able to have a a substantive conversation about it. I think I went in there sort of assuming, well, you know, he reads some of the books, you know, (laughs) or he reads a good chunk of the books, but I just didn't think anybody would read all of the books. (laughs) And so, um, you know, I sort of went in there uh, prepared at least for someone who would be able to, you know, to converse about it Mm -hmm. um, in a meaningful way. Well, Book Notes' hour-long format differed greatly from most of the network television interviews, which lasted three minutes or less. What do you think are the benefits and or drawbacks of this longer format for the author and for the viewer? Oh, my God, those three minutes or less interviews would kill me. <laughs> oh. Sometimes I, I want to just slide under the table. Oh. Because, you know, Makes Me Want to Holler was it's autobiographical. It was, ver- you know, clearly it's very, you know, um, personal. Mm-hmm. And on the macro level, uh, in the book, I... I deal a lot with my experiences as a black man in America Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, sort of projected out onto what was happening in the, in the, in the total landscape in America. Well, you know, to try to fit one of those conversations into three minutes or less (laughs) can be murder. (laughs) I imagine. And so quite often, one of the things that would happen to me that was very discouraging was that I'd, I'd be in the midst of an interview with someone who had not read the book, was not very informed on the topic, and, you know, so we we might ramble for two minutes, and then they'd look at me and, and, and say, uh, uh, we've got 30 seconds. Tell us, what are the solutions? Oh, <laughs> oh. What are the solutions to racial problems in America? <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I would want to just, I was like, I told my agent, I said, man, I can't do this. I can't. Oh. You know, because if you're serious about trying to, you know, get a handle on, you know, race in America, you can't do it in 30 seconds mm-hmm. or less. Unless you're Jesse Jackson or somebody. There you go. <laughs> Un- unless you're going for the quick and easy solution. The quick and easy solutions, right. Well, I... And, uh, you know, and so that, to me, those interviews were extremely difficult. Mm-hmm. So the notion of an hour-long format, you know, just by implication, meant that we really were going to delve into the subject matter. Well, I would like to know how, you know, Brian Lamb read the books, marked them up very thoroughly, uh, I would like to know, how does that change the interview experience? Oh, it changes it dramatically. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, I know for me, I relaxed more. Because, Mm -hmm. you know, I I saw that he had marked up the book and he read it. And I said, this guy has thought about this. Mm -hmm. And so automatically my level of respect goes up because I know he he respects the subject matter. Right. And so now we've got a conversation. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got a foundation for a substantive conversation, which was very important and still is very important to me. And he asked you a lot of questions, you know, just basic things that that he really wanted some context, some 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 answers to things like Jonin, and and the various terms, and how would you, as a black man, feel if I said this particular word to you? 
And I thought right. that that was just an amazing part of the interview, this this dialogue between you two, um, that became a a very um, honest discussion. Right. An honest and, as I recall, sort of a fun discussion. Oh, yeah. Um, and, a- again, I was, uh, I was sort of aware of people in the background as we were doing the interview, you know, blacks and whites and, you know, others. Mm-hmm. And I... I <laughs> I thought I heard sort of snickering off <laughs> someplace when we started talking about Joni. <laughs> um, because, you know, Brian, after a few minutes, I got a sense of Brian the person. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, he was, he's this very formal white man who was basically saying, okay, uh, let's not even pretend that I know anything about your world. <laughs> and so let's, you know, you know, you tell me what this means. And, um, you know, I said, I'm going to have some fun with this guy. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to show him what Jonan is. (laughs) And I I forget the tie tie he had on, but I had, um, on my way into the building, I think I had passed some vendors, and they were, you know, some of the vendors sell ties, and mm-hmm. um, I looked at his tie, you know, I looked at him and said, okay, if I was going to be, you know, if I was going to get involved in joning with him, where would I strike first? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I sort of went at him, and uh, <laughs> he kept a straight face throughout. <laughs> 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 I, <laughs> I don't know if this guy has a sense of humor or not, but this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought, that, like I said, the best way that I could uh, uh, explain to him what Joni was would be to demonstrate. Right. You know, of course, he didn't come back at me. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I think he got it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Mr. Lamb asked about an author's research and writing methods. Do you believe that the reading public finds these details about the practice of writing interesting? And do you think other authors or publishers find them interesting? Yes, I think, um, I mean, just based on, you know, how people grill me, I think they find mm-hmm. it find it interesting um i you know it's amazing uh the the number of people that ask me well you know tell me about the process tell me how do you write a book Mm -hmm. that's another one of those that makes you want to slide under the table (laughs) because (laughs) it takes you know it almost takes a book to to try and tell someone how to do it and uh so uh there are a lot of people interested. I know in writers, mm-hmm. as a writer, I, I'm i always reading about other authors because I'm curious about their process, where they write, what time of day they write. You know, I've learned that I'm a morning writer. I'm, mm-hmm. You know, a good night's rest. I clear the, you know, I've cleared the plate and um, my thoughts are more lucid in the morning in the evening when I've got, you know, events and other things that are on the plate as well. Um, and so, you know, I know writers are constantly studying each other mm-hmm. um, to pick up morsels of ideas about how to do it better. Uh, you know, the last, you know, time, last book I did, I even took notes on the process. I remembered uh, reading an interview in which Tom Wolfe uh, said that every time he wrote a book, he promised himself that he would never repeat the mistakes that he made in the previous book. Oh. And, and then when he starts a new book, he proceeds to repeat the mistakes that he made in the previous <laughs> book. <laughs> and I have also found that to be true. <laughs> And so, um, I, so we know writers and publishers are interested in it naturally, but I'm often surprised by the number of you know readers who are um, interested in process, mm-hmm. and not necessarily not always because they want to write, 
But I think, um, you know, they're curious about, you know, how you lose yourself, how you inhabit a project such as a book, mm-hmm. um, how you capture voice, how you, you know, the decisions that you made about characters and that sort of thing. Well, Mr. Lamb frequently asked his guests biographical questions. Of course, your book, Makes Me Want to Holler, uh, is an autobiography, obviously. So did any of his questions about you surprise you? And is this generally different from other author interviews you've experienced? I don't, I don't recall that any of the questions surprised me, per se. The interesting thing about that interview was that quite often I would do interviews and I would get a sense of whether the person interviewing me was empathetic Mm -hmm. or whether they, um, you know, whether there was some hostility there. You know, they, I mean, I, I was very blunt about, you know, my, my feelings and perceptions about what it means to be an African-American in this country, mm-hmm. um, you know, in contemporary terms and also historically. And uh, there were some people who, you know, clearly took offense to that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I recall one interview in particular. I, I get there, it was in, on the West Coast. I get there and I'm very tired and I'm sitting sort of... Um, slumped in my chair mm. and uh, the, the interviewer starts out well you know we, we're um, it was a radio interview we're um, interviewing today with Nathan McCall uh, he shot a man and he went to prison and he says it's all the white man's fault let's take calls from listeners oh <laughs> oh my goodness so, you know, needless to say, after that interview, I called my publishers uh, and, and publicity people say, look, you know, you can't, you, can't, you can't set me up like that. You can't allow someone to set me up like that. But, sure. And, you know, and so quite often I would get that, I mean, clearly this person was one of those who was hostile in that way. Right. Um, Brian would ask questions. Um, that were very straightforward, Mm -hmm. but I never got a sense of whether he agreed, whether he disagreed, whether he, I never got a sense. I can't tell you whether this guy is Democrat, Republican, (laughs) nothing. You know, I can't even, you know, begin to guess because he kept a straight face throughout. And um, that's, you know... That's helpful, right? Because you know, as a um, you know, you don't get defensive. Mm-hmm. You know, you you get the sense that th- here is someone who has his intellectual. He leads with his intellectual curiosity, mm-hmm. as opposed to his personal views. And so, you know, with that, it it doesn't matter whether we agree or disagree. You know, it's the the importance is we're dealing with the substance of the subject matter. Mm-hmm. So he doesn't get in the way of the interview in the way that um, so many other interviewers do. I mean, even those who are like just enthusiastic about the book, sometimes, I mean, you know, the the tough questions are important as well. Mm. You know, and so you're not always looking for cheerleaders, but someone who will set the foundation for real dialogue. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that, you know, struck me about Brian Lamb, that he is about the interview. Right. Well, did you watch Book Notes before you were on the program? And um, what did your... After that, your experience, what was your impression of the program? Um, I hadn't watched it as much before the program as I did after. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and before, I don't, you know, it was like, before, I sort of 
I realized that I sort of paid attention, but I didn't pay attention to Brian. And then after, I paid more attention to Brian, uh, much more attention. Of course, because by then I knew him mm -hmm. uh, and had met him. Um, but I loved the format, and I, you know, it um, it was just so refreshing. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I think it probably didn't make interviewing easier for me. If anything, it made it difficult, <laughs> more difficult, <laughs> in the sense that you know I came away from that and said, okay, that's what the experience should be. Ah. This is the standard. And so for me to go from that into another one of those three-minute three, three minute interviews or two-minute interviews was murder. Oh. You know? And so the interesting thing is that after all of these years, when I go places now, um, a large percentage of the people will say, when we were doing research on you, we, we, we saw the book notes interview. Right. They referenced that one. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, you know, I think uh, for good reason. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm curious, as as a journalist, would your uh, did your interview style change at all after working with Brian? Oh, good question. Um, I was, you know, throughout the process, I've had this kind of, par you know, parallel experience. Mm -hmm. Because as a journalist, I learned to do interviews. And when I suddenly became the person who was being interviewed, I at some point I said, my God, I see why so many people tell me they hate the media. <laughs> 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 you know, as a, when, when I was on the other side, as a person doing the interviews, I would often meet people. And I would try to ask them questions. They would say, I don't talk to the media. I don't trust them. I don't this and I don't that. And often I felt that the hostility was, you know, was not merited. Right. But then after I did some interviews, and I said, my goodness, this is terrible. <laughs> you know, one of the things that you learn as a journalist is that the questions that you ask often determine the answers that you can get. Mm -hmm. If you don't ask good questions, you can't, you can't good a get good answers Right. quite often. Yeah. And so um, I came away, uh, you know, over the years, I have lost respect uh, for the media. I would see myself misquoted. I would see things taken out of context. I would mm -hmm. see all of the things that people had told me about when I worked as a, you know, when I worked as a journalist. Right. And so, again, the, the, the book notes format just sort of lays it out there. I mean, it does what should be done, which is, you, you know, you ask good questions mm -hmm. so that you can get substantive answers and you trust that the viewers if given the right information, will come to the right conclusions. Right. You know, but mm -hmm. you don't get in the way of the process. You, you know, you, you do everything that you can to facilitate the process. And so that's what you, you know, mm -hmm. that's what I got, you know, with Brian. And um, I'm still working, trying to work on, you know, mastering the two-minute a three-minute interview. <laughs> I, did, I did one this summer. Um, I forget, maybe on the Trayvon Martin issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had maybe five people, you know, on the on the program. And we had maybe three minutes. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, I said, you know, I, afterwards I went back and <laughs> I said, I promised myself I wouldn't do this again. I wouldn't take mm -hmm. myself through this. <laughs> Um, and so that format, I, I just don't think you can beat it, mm -hmm. especially, um, you know, uh, dealing with substantive issues, right. uh, something like race, social issues mm -hmm. as well. 
Well, we're we're doing this interview in the shadow of the Ferguson, Missouri riots and after the Trayvon Martin um, situation. Where would you go yourself to find out more about these issues in a, a less mediated way than the three-minute interview? Um, you know, for newspapers, I, I, I follow the New York Times. Right. I still like, um, you know, I still like the long-form stories that, you know, um, give me co- as much context as possible, that are, you know, is thorough. Um, I hit the broadcast, you know, I hit, I hit CNN and some of the others for the um, uh, quick hits. Right. But I'm still very much a newspaper person. Um, because, um, you know, the, the broadcast has just gotten so much more uh, sensational. Right. And this is an issue. This is another one of those issues where, you know, we've gotten one perspective, mm-hmm. but I'm sort of holding my breath on this because I've, I've learned with, with the Trayvon Martin case, with the O.J. Simpson case, the Rodney King case, you know, evidence can point 99% in one direction. Right. And that 1%, that 1% that you don't account for might be, you know, might contain a major contradiction. Right. And so um, my approach is to try and, you know, I'll typically go to the to the newspaper, mm-hmm. to the Times, and then hit several, you know, broadcast networks to see what's being said, as well as online um, publications such as, you know, The Root, Mm-hmm. But the, the New York Times, Washington Post, uh, some of the online chatter, um, the mixture. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you what do you think about the 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 Twitter, all the Twitter feeds and all that going that that the that news gathering has now become very horizontal because we all have video cameras in our pockets and we can all get our opinion online instantaneously in 140 characters is well that I mean, seems probably, to be changing our, yeah, our world probably too. Comes no, as no surprise to you that I find that disturbing. <laughs> I find okay. it very disturbing because, um, at least there was a point at which there were very clear standards that, um, the media, the, the quote mainstream media set out to attain. Mm-hmm. And so whenever they fell short, we could cite their stated objectives and try to hold them to those standards. Mm. Those standards have become so blurred now that it's incredible. Um, it's just, I, you know, and um, journalism has become so shallow uh, that I think we're doing a great disservice to the public in general. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I can't tell you the number of times I, I watch um, news interviews, and um, I see qu- obvious questions that are not asked, mm-hmm. um, and not just in, in, in broadcast. But now I'm reading, you know, m- many of the news stories that I read, they just don't give you the historical context that you really need in order to understand an issue. Mm-hmm. And so I think there's something to be said about the impact of, you know, and I know a lot of the organ- news organizations are, you know, going for the young journalist, you know, they're, they're um, you know, you can pay them lower salaries and all of that, but they don't bring the historical context mm-hmm. that is so important um, to help people understand why something might have happened you know so in in missouri we need to know we know that there's you know the police officer's account we know that um there's a witness account um but what's the historical context on why people might have started burning and looting 
Right. You know, and, you know, for someone who's been around, um, you know, and, and who knows history, um, you know, we understand that there is a, there's a context for this. Um, you know, and for me, you know, there were, I, I thought about the riots in Detroit and other places, mm-hmm. and the, I thought about the, the Kerner Commission report, you know, on civil disorders. Um, where they, you know, explored the, the 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 reasons for the riots and that sort of thing, and so I think um, you just do, uh, you know, we're much of the media now we're doing we're doing a, a disservice to the public uh, in by shallow reporting, mm-hmm. and so those people who are, I mean seriously interested in being informed understand that they have to essentially kind of assemble their own news diet you know of outlets and papers that they trust right um you know to be as unbiased as possible uh you know to get their news Mm -hmm. i i i fear i have taken you too far afield (laughs) but thank you very much for your reflections on that i Okay. In in the midst of reading your book, I've been thinking about you know all of these things are churning while I'm reading your book as well. So I, so I hope I didn't take you too far afield. But unfortunately, I have to get back to book notes. Mm-hmm, sure. um, so I would like to know. I would like you to describe if you remember your experience on the program. I mean, what was the set like? What was it like going into the building? Uh, and what do you think the pluses and minuses are for such a simplistic setting and a and a very simple way of doing the show without a lot of the of the uh, spectacular effects and whatever? Yeah, I don't I don't remember a lot about um, going into the building and all of that. I do remember interacting with people behind the cameras. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I got to meet them, um, maybe a few before the interview, but, but more people afterward. And, uh, you know, the, the simplicity of the set, again, I think works, you know, worked, uh, perfectly with, uh, Brian style. And I think it, re- you know, reflected what I m- mentioned earlier the importance of um, dealing with the subject matter, the substance of the issue, mm-hmm. takes precedence over everything else. Um, and it's not about, you know, a, um, you know, a, sh- a sharp set. And so, um, but that that's what I remember most about it. Uh, saying that this is a place where you know, we can really sit down and talk. So, you know, I mean, I think, I, you know, again, I think the, the advantage to that, you know, when I look at some of the sets today, you know, um, it's, come on, sometimes I look at the sets and the way that people are dressed and it's like, oh, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> come on. You know, it's, it's, sort of, it's almost like an advertisement. You see some of these auto advertisements and they have this scantily clad woman standing in front of the car you know <laughs> and you know they're telling you the price of the car and you're saying well okay what are they really selling here <laughs> you <know? laughs> and so many of the sets that i look at are like that and, mm-hmm. and it, it feels sort of insulting really um <laughs> because you, you you know what they're doing and so I, you know, I'm a fan of the the more simplistic sets, the mm-hmm. you know the, the the kind of set that we had when I did the interview with Brian. Mm-hmm. Well, the book note series focused on nonfiction books published between the late 1980s and 2004. What do you think might be the advantage of an of a 800 book collection with this focus? Um, yeah, I, I never, 
I didn't know before I went on the set what the uh, focus was. Mm-hmm. You know, I knew it was uh, nonfiction. Right. And I thought, I just simply thought that that was a reflection of uh, Brian's interest. And, um, you know, again, with nonfiction, you're going to get a lot of uh, social issues, which is my thing. And so I always think that is supremely um, important. I didn't, in terms of the time period focus, I didn't understand what the thinking was that went into that Mm -hmm. and uh, never really... um, you know, I, I don't recall anyone articulating that to me or, or reading anything about mm-hmm. it. Well, Brian Lamb had a rule that authors could only appear on the program one time. That was the basic book notes uh, series. If asked, would you have returned for another interview? Um, I did. Um, well, I, I, I interviewed with him again. Right. And I certainly would have, um, yeah, I would have interviewed with, I would have said yes anytime. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, you got a guarantee that the guy is going to read your book. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like I said, you know you're going to have a substantive conversation. Um, that is so refreshing. Um you know, compared, you know, to the alternative. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, if if he wanted to do a weekly conversation, we could have done that. <laughs> 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 Was there a difference in the sales or the national attention for your book after the Book Notes interview? And I'd like to also know about the critical reception of your book. What was that like? I don't, yeah, I don't recall um, tracking the sales after the uh, book notes interview. I mm-hmm. do recall, you know, my sense of the impact is more anecdotal. Right. Um, every place I went, you know, people would tell me that they saw that interview. <laughs> and um, I had quite a few people who got in touch with me um, after seeing that interview Mm -hmm. and I mean we're talking like for years after you know (laughs) and so it certainly had an impact um I think and you know and my sense was that when they when they you know re-ran it um people would might come in on the middle of that you know it might be channel surfing and come in on the middle of that interview and were I think um you know sort of riveted by it right you know, Brian's style if you know if you know you, you, you can look at it and it, it's almost like an interrogation <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's almost it's, it's like an interrogation without the hostility that's it mm, okay <laughs> you know and so I know it had impact mm-hmm. um, you know but uh I didn't track the numbers. Mm. What was the? There was a second part to that question. Well, I'd like to know about the the critical reception oh, of right, your right. of your book. I mean, what did what did people feel about it? What did the general public feel about it? And also, what did the what did the African American public say about it? Mm-hmm. Right. I got the. I mean, I back then I got and still do sort of the full range of reactions um, to the book. Among African Americans, probably the most um, gratifying response that I have gotten um, came from black men, other black men. Mm. And um, I still get some today who come up and say, man, you told my story. Mm. You know, and um, that makes me, you know, that makes, lets me, reinforces for me that um, all that I went through um, was worth it. And um, that doing the book was worth it. Because uh, I had never written about myself. I had, 
uh, instead of writing about myself, I had hidden the fact that I had uh, grown up on the streets and gone to prison because I didn't think I would be able to get a job after prison. And I had, you know, I wrote about the experiences in which I had difficulty. Right. And so I learned um, to hide that. And so in writing a book, I knew I would be exposing myself completely. Yeah. And um, I, you know, you don't know, once you release it, you don't know what to expect. And so among many African-Americans, I, I got that response. Um, among many African-American women, um, I ha- had many who came and said, you know, you, you told the story of my uncle, of my brother. Mm. I'll never forget going to a book signing, and one young lady was in her 20s, and she bought about three or four books. And she said, you know, this one is from, from my uncle, and he's in prison. And, you know, she named a few people, and then she said, this one I want you to sign for my dad. Mm. He's, he's really in trouble. And um, I said, wow, she's in her 20s, and she's trying to save her father. Wow. Um, and so, and, you know, from people in the African-American uh, community, that was that reflected a lot of the response uh, from, you know, others There was the full range. You know, I got many whites, you know, who said, thank you for this book. I've been trying to understand, and you helped me understand so much that I just have not been exposed to. Um, And then on the negative side, um, I got an email just um, a week or so ago, (laughs) you know, um, I would get uh, hate mail. Uh. And I still get uh, hate email occasionally from people, you know, they, they don't understand it. I, I think some of them don't understand that in a sense they're being complimentary because um, I'll get messages in which people who have just read the book come away with a fresh anger as if the book was just published. Mm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, quite often they'll say, well, you know, this is America. You have every opportunity in the world, and you blew it, and you can't blame anyone else. Yeah. And so, you know, I think the reactions sort of represent you know, the range of perspectives that we have in the country right. anyway. Uh, and, you know, so it's been, overall, though, it's been, uh, it's been good. It's been a hell of a ride. Do you get uh, any uh, notes or reactions from students that, you know, say it's been used in a, in a, cl- a course? Do you yes, get many of yes, those I've reactions? Got, um, uh, um, uh, Quite often, college students who um, I've had a few students who've done thesis papers on the book, oh. um, and they've sent them to me. Um, you know, college papers. Uh, one teacher that I, I um, exchanged emails with last week in Florida. She's been uh, trying to get me to do um, to Skype with her class. Wow. Because she, she said, oh, I had them read the book, and they just don't believe that you're real. <laughs> <laughs> they don't believe that you're real. Oh, my. <laughs> and so I said, we're going we're gonna to do this. Wow. That's uh, great. <laughs> yeah. So, I... um, but yes, I've, uh, and I've heard from some professors who say that they use it in, like, sociology courses and, you know, even... Uh, mental health course. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, I yeah. think I think the copy I've been reading was done by a sociologist because it's it's got little yellow torn up pieces of yellow paper right, in right. it all over and it's got these these notes but but I can't understand them quite. I I'm not quite sure what the whoever wrote the notes is saying, so I think it's a sociologist. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Right. So you're being dissected like a frog. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And in time, I, I began to feel a 
a bit like a lamb mouth. Oh, dear. Well, what did your experience with Brian Lamb cause you... Well, I, I'd like to know, did your experience with Brian Lamb and book notes cause you to rethink uh, any of your own approaches or assumptions regarding your research or writing? No, I don't think so, um, regarding research or writing, but I just remember that um, it reinforced for me, for me what an interview should be. Mm -hmm. And so, again, I think in some ways, you know, when I do the two- and three-minute interviews, um, um, that's in the backdrop. Right. And that's why sometimes I turn them down. Mm. Um, because I think, you know, if I, if I think it's going to be a situation where it's impossible to tackle the subject matter, the substance of the subject matter, right. um, in that amount of time, the, the allotted amount of time, then I'll, I'll try not to do it because I don't want to come away frustrated. Right. Um, and I don't want to, um, you know, there's something about, I, I want to be respectful of the subject matter. Right. And I want to be interviewed by someone who's respectful of the subject matter. So he was, you know, he was, he sort of set a standard that I was intellectually aware of prior to that interview, but experientially aware of after the interview. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to know what you've been working on after Makes Me Want to Holler. Uh, if you could talk about some of the books you're, you've written and anything you're working on now. Yes. Um, after Makes Me Want to Holler, I did a book of... Uh, when I, you know, it's interesting, with Makes Me Want to Holler, I, I didn't finish the book in so much as I stopped it. Mm. You know, and so I had this feeling that there was so much more that I wanted to say. And so I talked with the publishers about it, and they allowed me to do a book of, you know, it's sort of a book of essays, social commentary. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, not only about, you know, race relations between blacks and whites, but um, issues within African-American communities and that sort of thing. And so I did that, which was a different kind of book. And uh, then, just before I left uh, the D.C. area, I had begun seeing the trickles of gentrification. And I began thinking about that issue. And I saw it here when I came to Atlanta as well. And so I began working on a book about gentrification. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, at some point, I realized, or I decided, and, and here we get to process, I approached it as a journalist would, which is to, you know, we go out sometimes and we see something that we're curious about and we explore the topic. Mm -hmm. And so I did that part, and I uh, concluded that I probably couldn't do an interesting book on gentrification um, because the people that I interviewed um, in general were, were very reluctant, seemed, were very reluctant to talk openly and honestly about their feelings, mm. the people moving into neighborhoods as well as the people who were there. Right. And so that's when I got the idea to do it as fiction. Ah. And so I said, oh, God, okay. So first time I do autobiography, which I had not done before. Second time I do a book of essays, which I had not done before. Mm-hmm. Third time I do fiction, which I had not done before. <laughs> so when am I going to get an opportunity to repeat, you know, a genre? Sure. Uh, and so now um, I'm doing a uh, book of short stories, which I have not done before. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Is poetry next? <laughs> <laughs> Already done that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> Bob, okay. That's okay. Bob, Bob I, never uh, interrupts. <laughs> I, I did a uh, I did a little uh, self published book of poems. Oh. When I, uh, short. I had uh, not long after I got out of prison. Mm-hmm. Um, I wrote a lot of poetry then. That's I, I seldom write it now. Mm-hmm. Well, getting back to book notes, in your estimation, what do you think has been the lasting impact of book notes, both when it originally aired and then now in subsequent times? Hmm. That's a good one. I think, you know, the, the impact has been, you know, for those who tuned in and tune in, I, you know, it is a, it is a standard. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, the, the people who tune into that are people who want substance. They want to talk about things at length. They want to delve deeper into things. And so, <laughs> um, I, I think it's more difficult, well, I know, it's more difficult to get that level of gratification today. Right. Because we deal, everything is, you know, fast and shallow. Right. And so I'm really worried, you know, about our collective ability to think, you know. And, Mm -hmm. you know, programs such as that encourage people to sit down and nurture their attention spans. (laughs) (laughs) You know, nurture their attention spans and to listen and to, you know, take in information, process it, sit with it. I'm, you know, I think I'll always be a fan of that process. Mm -hmm. And um, today, you know, it's, um, I think it's, 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 needed more than ever. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, you're, you're teaching now. Do you, f- do you emphasize that in your, in your classroom? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. I see a huge difference, though, in uh, attention spans, uh, foundational knowledge, um, in, in, in students who, you know, that, that I'm teaching today versus, say, 10 years ago. Um, I started teaching at Emory in um, uh, 99 mm. when I left Washington, and it's a, it's a brand new ball game. And so one of the first rules is all electronics, um, mm. you know, we have to turn them off. Right. But what I have found, and I'm not proud to say this, but it's a reflection of, of, of what we're dealing with, that the that I have found that I have to use more film, I have to use more visuals than ever to keep students' attention. Because, they, I mean, you know, I mean, they're like drug addicts, like going through withdrawal. Oh, you no. Know? If, you, if you keep them for an hour <laughs> and, you know, you don't, you don't show an image of something. Mm. And so we've become an image-oriented society. And so the notion of someone sitting down in a format, such as the format with Brian and myself, just sitting down, having an extended conversation, and people tuning in from all over the country and becoming, you know, uh, sort of becoming part of that conversation, is um you know that's a that's a classic interaction that you know should never die Mm -hmm. i would like to know if you have anything else that you would like to add about book notes or c-span or brian lamb brian lamb look after that first interview, you know, I came in with said, Brian, I, Brian Lamb is my main man. <laughs> <laughs> He's my main man. Um, we did an interview some years later, and um, we were just delighted to see each other, you know. And and uh, I think that, I think he smiled then. <laughs> <laughs> I think he smiled then. And, uh, you know, he just 
just an example of a real pro. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's that's it. And so I think, you know, in its C-SPAN, um, in presenting that format, uh, has done a great service, uh, you know, for helping promote thinking. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's not something to be taken for granted, oh, yeah. especially in this day and time. You know, it, and so it, it prompts people to to slow down and to process. Um, so, yeah. And on that note, I have reached the end of, of my questions, Professor, but I would like to thank you for agreeing to do this oral history interview. Uh, and for sharing your experiences on book notes. Thank you so much, sir. All right, thank you.